Well, thank you, everybody, and I um, want to uh, again welcome the President to California and, and thank him uh, for once again focusing his attention, as no other previous administration has, on addressing the ravages of climate change, in particular here on the West Coast, but notably in California, the challenges of wildfires. California is currently dealing with 15 large active wildfires. So far, year to date, 2.2 uh, 5 million acres have burned. Uh, remarkably, uh, that is double the five-year average, but it's substantially less than what we experienced this time last year, where over 3 million acres have burned. We're dealing with conditions and consequences of climate change, the likes of which uh, were predicted, but predicted a decade or two from today. Those challenges are not only vexing, but those challenges create opportunities. And I know the President will be speaking a lot about those opportunities in the next day and the upcoming weeks as he refers to the work he's doing to advance uh, this historic uh, infrastructure package. But I want to just make a point, uh, Mr. President, with uh, your uh, indulgence that despite the President of the United States being here, uh, I would stipulate the most powerful force on the planet is, is not even the President of the United States. It's Mother Nature. She is, as others have said, all she is is chemistry, biology, and physics. She bats last, she bats a thousand. Uh, we are dealing with extremes the likes of which we've never dealt with in our state's history, including the most extreme weather in terms of the hottest summer we have ever experienced in California's history between June and August. A West Coast drought that some have referred to as a mega drought that arguably began in 2000. The hots are getting a lot hotter, the dries are getting drier, and as you saw on the East Coast of the United States, where people quite literally were drowning in their cars, the wets are getting a lot wetter with atmospheric rivers and the consequences of warming seas and more intense tropical storms as well as hurricanes. And so I'm here sobered by the challenges and that reality, but also, as I noted, optimistic uh, by not only California's capacity to work through situationally, and we are. The Calder fire that we just visited uh, that took the town of Grizzly Flats, uh, that fire now is 67 percent contained. The Dixie fire uh, now about three quarters contained. Uh, situationally, uh, we are battling these wildfires and making progress. But the sustainable mindset we have is to address these smash mouth realities and to lead the conversation anew in this country to radically change the way we produce and consume energy uh, and to continue to lead our nation leading efforts as it relates to low carbon green growth. Uh, California's leadership is demonstrable. California's leadership has been challenged in the last four years, but those headwinds now are tailwinds with the Biden administration. We're not sparring partners, we're working partners as it relates to issues of climate change and dealing with the challenges of wildfires. And so, Mr. President, I'm just honored that you're here. Uh, we are all blessed, 40 million Californians strong, that you took the time to be here. Uh, but as I began, let me end by saying um, this is not your first foray into this issue. Uh, we held two summits with West Coast governors, proactively held with the President's assistance. Not only did he show up to make remarks, he stayed until the end of both conversations. I've been around this business long enough to note the distinction between people that are interested in things and people that are committed to solving things. The President of the United States' commitment is demonstrable. Now the third time here physically seeing the impacts of these wildfires for himself. But his commitments he made in June, the commitments he made in July, the promises that he made to follow up, he delivered on. We had specifically four things we requested of the President of the United States, all four he delivered on. And so, Mr. President, let me also take this moment not just to thank you for being here at this critical juncture, but thank you for delivering on your promises. Thank you for meeting this moment head on, and thank you for leading a conversation anew in this country around resiliency and around painting an optimistic picture of the future as we transition to a low-carbon, green growth future. And so with that, 
uh, let me introduce the President of the United States, Joe Biden. Thanks, guys. Well, folks, uh, thank you, Governor, for those comments. I want to say good afternoon and uh, to all of you here in this cool hangar. <laughs> Earlier today, uh, we were briefed by the National Interagency Fire Center in Boise, Idaho. The center located is a locational hub for our federal firefighting resources in the region. And we just surveyed some of the damage of the Calder Fire here in California which in less than a month has wiped out for 200,000 acres and 1,000 structures. Homes, precious memories destroyed, air quality degraded, local economy stopped in its tracks, and nearly 200 people in the area forced to live in shelters. Everyone in Northern California knows the time of the year when you can't go outside, when the air will be filled with smoke and the sky will turn a apocalyptic shade of orange. Parents worried about keeping their children safe in a pandemic worry about air quality as well. Thus far, the nationwide over 44,000 wildfires have burned nearly 5,300,000 acres, roughly the size of the state of New Jersey. In California, this year, more than 2.2 million acres have burned. The Dixie Fire burned nearly 1 million alone. And we're working closely with Governor Newsom to make sure California has every resource, every resource available to keep families safe. And the governor has led his state with poise and strong leadership. He's been an innovator in items of for long-term solutions, and he and I are both optimistic. These fires are blinking code red for our nation. They're gaining frequency and ferocity, and we know what we have to do. And it starts with our firefighters, putting their lives on the line in rugged and dangerous conditions. I never forget coming out to Arizona in 2013 to speak at the memorial of the 19 Granite Mountain hotshots who gave their lives. Firefighters are, are unmatched in their bravery. That's why I took the action I did in June to ensure that all federal firefighters earn at least the minimum wage, and we're working on fundamentally changing the benefits that are available to them. FEMA has approved 33 fire management assistance grants to help Western states pay for the cost of fighting these awful fires. We used the Defense Production Act to address the shortage in fire hoses. Because of the pandemic, we found ourselves in a situation where there's a backlog in an awful lot of things. We restarted the idle production line in Oklahoma, bringing back to work and delivering thousands of new feats of new fire hoses to the front lines. Hard to believe, short on fire hoses. In addition, We've tapped DOD, the Department of Defense, for 10 aircraft, 20 C-130s, a modular airborne firefighting systems with those systems. And to help our fire suppression, the RC-26 aircraft to provide critical imagery from space. They're based in California, and they've now flown over 1,000 missions across the West. 250 active duty military troops on, ground, uh, on the ground at Dixie Fire in California, working alongside firefighters. We're sharing satellite imagery to help detect and monitor fire growth. And the EPA is using new technology to deliver fire, smoke, and air quality information directly to people's cell phones. Our friends from Canada and Australia are providing help through both firefighters as well as aircraft. And my Build Back Better plan includes billions of dollars for wildfire preparedness, resilience, and response, forest management to restore millions of acres, and to protect homes and public water sources. This bipartisan bill 
includes more than $8 billion to increase resilience in wildfires. And add uh, and to that, counting resolution packages include the continued resolution package include $14 billion in disaster needs, including $9 billion for communities hit by wildfire and drought. We're not going to leave these people in distress. We know that decades of forest management decisions have created hazardous conditions across the western forest. But we can't ignore the reality that these wildfire, wildfires are being supercharged by climate change. It isn't about red or blue states. It's about fires, just fires. In the past two weeks, I've been to Louisiana, where Hurricane Ada hit, and with winds up to 179 miles an hour gusting. New Jersey and New York, walking down the streets, main streets, meeting with families and first responders, seeing the destruction of these disasters caused, dreams crushed, lives interrupted. Scientists have been warning us for years that extreme weather is going to get more extreme. We're living it in real time now. Extreme weather cost America last year $99 billion. Let me say it again. Extreme weather in the United States cost the United States of America a total of $99 billion. And this year, unfortunately, we're going to break that record. It's a devastating loss to our economy and for so many communities. When we, and we fail to curb pollution from smokestacks and tailpipes and continue to use fossil fuels as we do, we increase risk that firefighters face. But each dollar we invest in resilience saves up to $6 down the road when the next fire doesn't spread as, wisely, as widely and those investments also save lives. When I think about climate change, I think about not the cost. I think about good paying jobs they'll create. But I also think about the jobs we're losing due to impacts in the supply chains and industries because we haven't acted boldly enough. We have to build back. And you've heard me say it 100 times. Not just build back, but build back better as one nation. we got to do it together. We'll get through this together. We just have to keep the faith. Folks, we have the bipartisan infrastructure bill that's been passed and is bipartisan, and I believe will get done the so-called reconciliation bill that has another several trillion dollars in it. Let me close by saying, when people talk about the cost of the Build Back Better proposal beyond the infrastructure. Let me remind you, the cost may be as much as $3.5 trillion. But to put that in perspective, it's spent out over 10 years, number one. And number two, it's expected the economy, our economy, will grow to $366 trillion GDP by that time. That's less than 1.5 percent total in terms of deficit of that total amount. In addition to that, the 90 percent of it's paid for. And so, folks, we have to think big. Thinking small is a prescription for disaster. We're going to get this done. This nation is going to come together, and we are going to beat this climate change. Thank you.